My name is Dushi Satyanathan. I'm the Vice Provost of Academic Planning. It's truly a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, colleagues. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, you're all in many ways in a critical place in the graduation initiative for the campus. Uh, and so thank you so much for taking the uh, and being so willing to participate in this discussion. So uh, in this discussion, we will highlight the importance of graduation initiative, uh, the, the activities that support the graduation initiative, uh, policies centered around this initiative, and also discuss the future of Long Beach. As you know, we have made a lot of progress over the last decade. I know you probably have a lot to share in this space. So it's an exciting space for me and having worked with all of you in many ways for over the many, many years. So uh, I have a number of questions and, uh, and we can go around and you can introduce yourself as you answer your first question, if you will, uh, instead of going around introducing each one of you at this time. So uh, I'll start with Beth. Uh, Beth, what are, you, what are your top priorities for Graduation Initiative 2025? Thanks, Dushi. So my name is Beth Mankey. I'm currently serving as the Interim uh, Assistant Vice President for High Impact Practices. Um, in terms of priorities, I mean, I think, you know, on the, the surface or uh, the first would be obviously addressing and looking at increasing graduation rates. You know, so we're thinking about those graduation rates for first time freshmen, four year, uh, two year graduation rates for transfers. But I think even beyond that is that I think uh, one of or the collection of priorities for our campus include the understanding of why, not just the what, like uh, how how many students are graduating, but why are students maybe not graduating as fast as we think they ought to? And so really moving beyond to think about, you know, how do we remove barriers for student success? Um, how do we address identified equity gaps when they do exist? Um, but doing it really from a data-driven uh, perspective of thinking about what is there and then collecting data from students to understand why and how. Because I think at the end of the day, we can't graduate students we don't retain. And I think that's something that maybe we don't oftentimes talk about is that it's not just simply let's just graduate people in four or two years, but understanding what's best for them, understanding what are their hopes, what are their goals. We know that students don't graduate in a timely way if they don't have a destination after graduation. So thinking about high impact practices, internships, uh, study abroad, things like that. So I think all of those kind of come together under our priorities under that larger heading of thinking about graduation rates, um, thinking about persistence. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Beck. I mean, Long Beach prides itself from being providing access as well as ensuring that we provide a space for success. And I think the whole idea about providing access and success has been played out well. And so you're articulating some of the themes in that, in that discussion. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, Deb, uh, what parts of the graduation did you participate in, Deb? Thanks, Tushi. Good morning. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Liberal Arts, and I'm responsible for enrollment management, for student success, and graduate studies all under the umbrella of GI 2025. So that means I'm involved in ensuring the continued success in our graduation rates, continuing to redefine possibilities for educational excellence, including those high impact practices that Beth mentioned a moment ago, and just in general, uplifting student success for CSULB students. In CLA, we're very proud of our graduation rates and uh, we graduate a lot of students, some 3000 degrees in bachelor's and master's programs. And we're very proud to lead the university with our undergraduation undergraduate graduation rates, including for historically underrepresented minority and Pell eligible students. Um, to Beth's point earlier, we also wanna support our students through their degree process. And in that regard, we support some 600 students via academic internships in our career readiness and internship program. We serve tens of thousands of students via our proactive advising and our advising center. And in particular, I wanted to point out our transfer learning communities, both at the freshman level and at the transfer level. We know that helping our students acclimatize to campus and creating peer bonds with one another are the kinds of supports that will enable them to achieve academic success through their time at CSULB. Deb, I mean, what, one of the things that I was impressed with what you said is how you define success beyond simply graduation. It's really about how students are successful 
after they finish and the kinds of things they're able to do once they have a degree in their hand. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that that's a powerful way to sort of say, uh, what is success? It's not simply the diploma in the hand, right? It's more, it's more than that. It's a little bit more than that. And I think creating that space is uh, a big deal for the campus. Does anybody have any comments about that? Anything you want to share in that space? John? Yeah, I would, I would add, Dushi, that one of the things that, um, you know, campuses, I guess, across the nation struggle with is being student ready. And I think that we are um, doing a better job in being student ready that pulls all this student success and defining it together because it's just not on the student, the graduate, you know, we said graduation rate is one of the factors, but it's also what we do as a community on campus to make the, to build a sense of belonging, um, make, be able to market what we have available for students as far as academic resources um, on campus and beyond campus. So I think, I, I, um, yeah, I commend De Deb for what her and her colleges are doing and the Division of Student Affairs as we kind of bridge and weave those kind of things together. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, uh, I want to continue the same question, but uh, what parts of the graduation who did, uh, did Chris, Chris, you participated in? Because I know you're coming from the natural sciences side and you have a different take on that same question. So Chris, would you hear me? So my name is Chris Slovensky. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Programs in the College of Natural Science and Mathematics. And I think that I agree with what John just mentioned. I think that it is very important, you know, beyond just graduating students, it's very important to ensure that they have very positive experience at the beach. And, you know, to this end, we know that some students, particularly those from underrepresented or underserved backgrounds, actually do not have the same sense of belonging and the same sense of enjoyment of college experience than other students. And I think it is important that we work to bridge this gap. I mean, this experience gap later on converts itself, so to speak, into really opportunity gap and lower graduation rates. And so this is one area that we really want to focus on. And in CNSM, we do this by, you know, very extensive programs in growth mindset and belonging interventions, as well as creating peer learning opportunities for students. We have a, a very extensive learning communities, almost one third of CNSM freshmen are in learning communities, and we know those experiences very frequently conducted in close collaboration with student affairs division really bridge the gap and, and you, know, you know provide better opportunities for students. In the same vein, I think that students are do not feel that they belong in campus if they are not successful. So it is very important to ensure that we truly meet the students where they are and to provide those initial opportunities in the first semester, in those first courses, you know, to ensure the students are successful. And so to this end, uh, our mathematics department really made a very major redesign of quantitative reasoning courses over the last four years. Overall, we have improved the completion of the GE before quantitative reasoning courses in the first semester from about 60% uh, in 2017, to almost 80% last year. So this is a big success. And you know, the sense of passing the courses students are taking. This is very important in ensuring that they actually enjoy their experience and they truly belong uh, in the academic community at the beach. Thanks, Chris. I mean, we know that uh, the student success in a particular course is important. And we realize that the quantitative reasoning is one of those bottlenecks that prevent a student from making progress, right? And I think uh, your college and along with all others have made a phenomenal progress over the last several years of really decreasing the, uh, increasing the success rate of those students. In well, those absolutely. To, to me personally, this notion of meeting students where they are is really critically important. And so it's not only about courses, it's also about our placement mechanisms, about ensuring that our summer is used wisely so we really know that if student is placed into a particular course, student is really able to succeed and, and enjoy the experience. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I want to go to ask uh, John, how are you involved? And also introduce yourself, John. How are you involved in GI 2025? Um, John Hamilton, Associate Vice President for University Access and Retention. Um, just looking at the six priorities for GI 2025, a couple of them that we're involved in is being data informed decision making right and so 
looking at access and retention for our students, trying to make sure that not only do they graduate, that they're retained. And I know we, in this conversation, we, we mentioned on underrepresented minority students. Um, when we take a deeper dive with that, when we look at our African-American students or Latinx students, we wanna make sure that they're all also are meeting um, the same success standards that across the campus. So one of the things that um, Division of Student Affairs has done, our VP, um, coming on board was she created funding for a black resource center to be fu funded and staffed. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, that helps with kind of moving that forward. When we talk about a sense of belonging, having a place where students can go to, to re re receive direct resources or referrals across campus definitely helps us. And then another thing we've done is um, one of the priorities is financial support. And so we have been working very diligently with our development team and also across campus with bringing additional funding because we know that sometimes a financial aid package covers some of what a student needs, but not all of it. And so we want to make sure that we're bringing in grants, we're bringing in scholarships, and so that we're trying to mitigate that part that we perceive also as a barrier for students, the financial aid piece, so we can make a more additional and intentional piece of their um, college experience with removing some of that anxiety. Yeah. John, you touched on probably one of the most biggest or the biggest barriers for a student for higher education, which is financial, right? Higher education has become uh, exorbitantly expensive today. And, and uh, I'm proud to say Long Beach prides itself being accessible and affordable in this very difficult space. And on top of that, we also pride ourselves in the fact that uh, the students leave with one of the lowest debt in the nation. And so in, in many ways, we are living the dream of public education that you know many, many, many states are trying to sustain or at least preserve. And so leading that public education space is extremely important. So, uh, and it's becoming, as you can see, many, very, access, very hard in California and to have a, uh, uh, in some sense, hard to have affordable education in California. Well, I think it's harder in many other states, but here with many other challenges, it's even harder to some degree. But uh, we are making progress. Deb, you're going to say something. Yeah, if I may j jump in, I think the funding piece is so critical. And um, in CLA, we've recently launched a funded graduate recruitment effort. And this is specifically designed to recruit promising students into the humanities and social sciences at the graduate level with the recruitment of first generation and historically underrepresented and or economically disadvantaged students strongly encouraged. And we've just kicked off our first cohort with about two dozen students this, uh, this academic year. And I, I truly believe that without that funding, these are two dozen students who would not have entered into a graduate studies pathway. So I mm -hmm. believe the funding that John was mentioning and you were, you were um, amplifying is, is huge for us. Yeah. yeah. I would also add, you know, um, I was just reading this morning about the fact that uh, students' inability to uh, access transportation and pay for transportation has been a major reason why they've um, withdrawn or dropped out, right? And so I know within Long Beach, we've got a program K through 12 and with community colleges where students can get free bus and train passes. And so that might be something that we want to further consider as well, because, you know, it's something that we don't talk about a lot, but even just having students um, be able to get to campus is an issue. Kerry, it's a good point. You know, we talk about tuition and the cost of tuition, but the real burden is actually the cost of living in Long mm -hmm. Beach. Mm -hmm. And particularly for students who are coming from out of, out of, out of non-local areas, mm -hmm. where the cost of living is you know, exorbitant and, and trying to afford living here, driving here or transportation, all that is makes it very complicated. To, mm -hmm. I mean, hard to manage that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that I think this campus has pri uh, takes pride in is, is how we have removed barriers and administrative barriers. And I think no other person can probably answer this question than Donna. So Donna, talk a little bit about what process tools and systems have been put in place and, and please introduce yourself too. Thank you, Dushi. My name is Donna Green and I'm the Assistant Vice um, President of Enrollment Services. And believe it or not, Enrollment Services plays a major role in supporting our students and advisors through facilitating graduation and student success. My um, 
team and I have looked and identified efficiencies, reduced some of the barriers for our students and streamlined the process. For example, we realize that students are coming from high school where they have a class of 2025, they're going to graduate and they know when they're going to graduate. We now have provided students with a four year future term on their record that says, now I'm coming in and my plan to graduate is within four years of my admission date. Or for transfer students, we have the two year uh, graduation date. So that's providing a goal for students, which they never saw before. So seeing that on their record, I think is really helping them identify with the class. We also had the uh, opportunity to identify some of our tools, our degree planner and our degree audit, which can assist us in providing data to the advisors and to the students on where they stand with graduation. For example, when students come in as a pre-major, they're in, they have to um, complete major specific degree requirements. And then they used to go to their advisor to see if they were able to get into the major. This is now automated for them. So the minute they complete their major specific degree requirements and get the GPA, we automatically put them in the major, congratulate them that they're in the major and provide that information to the major advisor so that they can facilitate that movement with the student. We also have these tools in place that look at graduation candidates. Are they on track or off track? So if a student applied to graduate, say for next spring, we have a program that's in place that says, you are off track and it sends them an automatic email that says, it nudges them to please look at what courses you enrolled in because you're not fulfilling all your graduation requirements. This is also a report that's provided by, to the advisors or to the associate dean. So it's by major or by college. It also lists all their outstanding courses so that the colleges can actually look at what courses students need to graduate and make sure they have enough sections of those courses available for students. We looked at some of the barriers that students had and one of the barriers, believe it or not, was the petition to graduate because there's a fee attached to it. So what we now have is a process in place that reviews the student's record, looks and see are they enrolled in all the courses they need to graduate for the next term, and it systematically puts that graduation term on the student's record, puts them as a candidate so they're with that cohort, which will be reviewed and hopefully ultimately graduated. We decided that faculty play a fatal, very important role for students, not a fatal role, a very important role on students' graduation. So we actually went to the faculty class roster and put graduation candidacy status on there. So faculty will know if some of their students are graduation candidates for that term, they can help facilitate their success and see if they're dropping off the radar. We implemented a few other things that assisted with the registration. Uh, we have something known as uh, reserve seats, and many of the colleges are now reserving seats for their graduation candidates to make sure they get that major requirement for their senior year so that they can graduate on time. Some of you know that we also um, did some work with our fee deadlines so that students no longer have to pay within 30 days. They now have, uh, payment, initial payment due the middle of July, and then they can pay for their final uh, fee payment right before classes start. So get, that gives them an opportunity to get the, the uh, funding they need throughout the summer so that they can stay in all their classes. In the past, if the students did not pay the fee, we would drop them out of their essential classes for graduating, and then other people would take their place. So this way the student maintains their enrollment and their progress to degree is not uh, disturbed by funding sources. Donna, I know you can probably spend the whole day listing on and on all the barriers that you have removed for students, but it's really phenomenal. I mean, particularly the one you talked about the last, about the fee due date where, you know, if you don't pay the fee, you don't drop, your class are dropped. That's a huge, huge win for students in many ways. Yes. You know, no matter- I've this really is not, been very receptive to that. Right, and the enrollment services team working on this, and this is no, uh, no, no small feat because this is the reason why we are have the third highest graduation rate in the CSU system, and we have the you know the highest graduation for transfer students in the system. But this is you know uh, it's it and, and and we were in the in the fifties graduation rate about a decade ago. So the the progress we have made over the last decade is phenomenal. And so thank you, Donna, for the highlighting some of the many many accomplishments we have had. And as we look into the future. 
uh, I know that uh, there, are no, <laughs> there are plenty of challenges ahead of us. So Kerry, can you share about what you think about the future anticipated challenges from your perspective? I think there's two things that I think about um, as we talked earlier about meeting students where they are and being student ready, I think we have to really think about what that means and the multiple sources of data we're gonna have to collect and continue to collect and be nimble as we collect it. Um, I think at times it, it's easy in higher ed to kind of think that we know um, and kind of have an idea of this is exactly what students would want or I heard from one student and so that's what we should do. Um, so how do we collect data that is um, amiable um, and really can help us to think about meeting them where they are and being student ready in that way, which I think connects to the second piece that I think will will have a challenge and although um, GI 2025 calls us to look at equity gaps in these broader categories of Pell and URM. I think we're going to have to disaggregate that data and really dive in and see why um, and ask the questions that Beth was talking about earlier, how and why, uh, to really help us move the needle on addressing those gaps and, and seeing what our specific subcommunities and um, different race and ethnicity groups may need that can be really proactive in supporting, in supporting the student success for graduation and retention. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, you know, uh, the future is paved with many uncertainties as we go into the future. And one of the things we everybody's anxious about is also the fact that declining in high school graduation rates and that further might be an issue as we go into the, look into the future. Obviously, Southern California and Long Beach is sort of in a protected nest in this space by the high volume. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? I think population changes as well as K-12 changes, right? We see a curriculum change happening in K-12 and higher ed, you know, we don't often talk with K-12 about what that change is. And I think we've done a better job in higher education in terms of access, thinking about why do we have entrance exams or what are these, these markers of data that we're using for understanding that transfer from the K-12 education pipeline to higher education. But I think we have a lot that we'll have to navigate to really think about what our community is and especially in the Long Beach community, how we can be working to address some of those challenges. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Carrie Johnson, uh, one of the things that you have been working very hard is about over the last few years uh, with, the, with the pandemic, our whole student success initiative has been really truly challenged. And I know you have spent a lot of time in this space trying to navigate this. So share with us about how you think our graduation is affected over the, by the past year's challenges. Oh, sure, thanks Dushi. Um, yeah, we know the pandemic has had a significant impact on students' progress. Students have been taking educational leaves, they've been withdrawing, they've been taking fewer units. And as we discovered in the transition to online and Zoom services, um, student engagement with support services went down, right? Um, and we know this has been one of the factors that's impeded their progress. You know, we made that big shift where advising and tutoring all went online. That was a massive change for students. And initially, it was just difficult for them to figure out how to find these services. You know, and it's also true that many students aren't comfortable seeking help when they need it anyway. Um, and so you know, when we switched over to the online and Zoom environment, this just became more challenging. They had to figure out websites and navigate those and try to find the services. They just weren't able to walk into um, a, a tutoring center, for instance, and get the support they needed. So um, in order to respond to these challenges, we decided that we would make uh, them more available to students. And so we embedded tutors and academic co coaches in our early start courses this past summer um, in order to introduce them, students to these services early on, right? And before classes began. And we continued with embedded tutors in specific math and composition courses this fall. Uh, and both the students and the instructors have ins responded positively to these initiatives. Um, when the tutors are part of the course, their presence is normalized, and this helps to mitigate the stigma, stigma of working with them. Um, and it's also just easier for students to find them and get to know them, so they're making connections with tutors. Um, the more students engage with tutors and academic coaches and get the support they need to be successful, the more we can continue to close our equity gaps and improve our graduation rates. Um, and we're, of course, already looking ahead to keeping these practices in place. Um, as you know, we're looking also at keeping online and Zoom coaching and academic advising services in addition to possibly supplemental instruction, right? Um, and so we're looking at keeping these available for longer hours, not just during business hours. 
um, so that students can get these services when they actually want them. And we're also seeing that, um, you know, there's been increased peer mentoring across the university. So we've done a number of things, I think, to try to bring services closer to students, to make them more available. And uh, our challenge now is looking forward to the future and figuring out which of these services will continue in these uh, modes and how, how, how much and how often. That'll all depend on student need, I think, and uh, demand. Carrie, the, uh, one of the challenges is that our advisors have been working overtime over mm -hmm. the past pandemic, trying to keep up with the high volume of uh, student demands. And uh, I know that it's tireless and it's not over. It's, it's an ongoing challenge. It isn't. And I think, you know, this is a challenge. I don't think it's just a challenge on our campus, right? I think advisors, um, you know, advisors are the first, they're the first person to see students. There's a lot asked of them. And I think, you know, staffing is probably an issue at a lot of other campuses, right? So I think as we look to the future, more holistic uh, models of advising so that students are really uh, presented with more of a transformational advising experience than a transactional experience, but that requires, it requires staff, right? It, it requires enough folks for these people to be able to talk to, for students to be able to talk to. And so that's, I think, one of our challenges moving forward is how do we provide enough support, especially with advisors, right, to make those um, it, it interactions um, as positive and productive as we want them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you spend a lot of time with students, and uh, I know you are high, you know, there's one person in this room that's student centric, you know, we always point to Jeff in many ways. So Jeff, what do you see as the future for CSU and GI 2025? Well, thank you, Dushi. Um, I serve as the Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and uh, really appreciate you including me in this conversation. And Beth and Carrie have both pointed out the data factor, right? So uh, as we look to the future, we always need to do this through the lens of our students that we serve and use that data to help inform us and how best are we gonna move that dial? So when we look at our students, we know that over 70% are on some form of financial aid. Of that, 50% are classified as low income. We have 37.7% uh, of our students are experiencing some form of food insecurity, and about 12.5% are experiencing um, housing insecurity. So that sets a lens for which we need to, how can students be worried about their academics when they don't know where they're going to get their next meal or where they're going to sleep tonight? So that is, we're very lucky at Cal State Long Beach. We have one of the most robust programs in the system. We're fortunate in California that our state legislature has invested in basic needs and mental health. Um, we recently had a, a survey done through the uh, College Health Association and the National College Health Assessment. And uh, three of the top five factors that are impacting our students' uh, academics are stress, anxiety, and depression. So if we don't help address the mental health of our students, they're gonna struggle in their classes. And so I'm happy to report as a campus and certainly under the leadership of our vice president, uh, we're gonna be rolling out a, a new mental health model. Um, we're gonna be doing some more in the area of student engagement. As soon as students get admitted, we're gonna have peers reaching out to students to help improve that sense of belonging, to help them identify resources earlier, uh, we already have our cultural welcomes, which we're going to continue to grow those. So those are some of the areas that are, to me, we're already doing, but we need to continue to, to double down. Like in terms of basic needs, we know that there are certain populations that are, are less likely to seek out help. So why do we wait for them to seek help? We need to be more intentional identifying, using the data and reaching out to them and providing that support in a, manner, in a manner that shows them that we value them as students. Um, also, I think other key factors, uh, we need to uh, try to graduate our students it, you know, through the, uh, continue to review our policies and procedures to ensure that students can finish in two years and four years so we can get them graduated sooner and get out into the economy. Uh, we'll graduate them with le less debt. As Dushi pointed out, our campus is one of the best in the nation for graduating students with the least amount of debt. So this is important that our policies and procedures continue to reflect that. And then finally, I think um, we have to continue to review our courses with community colleges to enhance those articulation agreements so it becomes 
more transparent and seamless for students to transfer to CSULB. So I think if we focus on those four areas, uh, along with all the other things that we're gonna be doing, uh, I think we'll have more success. Thanks, Jeff. You know, uh, you, what you're pointing out is the challenges that students face as they, not just academic, but all other pieces as a whole student that we need to focus on in order success, right? And so, uh, you know, as we look into the future, this is an area that we need to work hard at. And so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, open the question to the floor here in a sense that uh, in many ways, the, the public education space is challenged in, in many of these fronts, right? So uh, as we look into the future, you know, uh, what do you see as the things that we as Long Beach should remain focused on so that we don't lose sight of the, the big picture of success? You know, what are the things that you are sort of aim, aiming at, Beth? Yeah, I was just gonna respond to that question by extending something that Jeff said is, you know, really pointing out the data piece. Um, you know, one of the things that I think all of us uh, have really come to is this idea of knowing that data about students is not the same as data from students. And so I think as we're thinking about the future and how do we stay on track is that making sure that in these spaces where we are addressing food insecurity, housing insecurity, all of the mental health problems, that we're giving voice to students in those spaces, that we're really hearing from students about what are they experiencing, why might they not be graduating, and what we believe to be a timely fashion. Um, you know, so to really understand the how, the why, and to implement interventions is we have to be willing to do the hard work to make space for student voices. So I would put that out there as one of those pieces. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up. I think that we did a great job over the last decade in connecting students with advisors and connecting advisors together. So there is a holistic system of support. You know, participants know what others are doing. I think that the next step would be to do the same for students. And this is to sort of piggyback on what Beth said and what Jeff said. I think that there is enormous amount of information about students, which is not necessarily shared. And I think the big question is, how do we do this in a fashion that this information is used to optimize students' experience? You know, what information faculty need to know? What information academic advisors need to know? This information might reside in a different places on campus. And I think that the next great challenge is to make sure that this information is used to the benefit of the student in a variety of circumstances on campus. So this sort of sense of connected metacognitive campus is something that, that I think we can try to build going forward. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we, are, we are in a space where we live in a world of inequities, right? Inequity surrounds us both around the, around the state, around the world. Uh, and, and we find that higher education is a space that has the ability to uh, propel those students in these inequity spaces to social mobilities that's not even possible or even uh, in a, uh, uh, accessible, right? And I know all of you have talked a little bit about that. Can you talk a little bit about or share a little bit about the concept of social mobility and what you think higher education does uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that space? Well, can I join in with one of my favorite stats, which is we are currently third in the nation in terms of social mobility for our students. So I think I'm so proud of that, but I think what we're hearing in our collective conversation here is all the ways we can dig deeper into student experience and to hear from our students. We have a group represented in this call who've been instrumental in, in um, uplifting our um, data informed culture on campus. And that's going to be crucial, I think, in terms of maintaining that social mobility piece for students. Um, as a, a few people said, hearing from our students themselves about what they're, what they're experiencing and what they need. So that, you know, I know we've moved up over the years that to being number three right now, and we have a couple more slots that we can go in terms of being transformational for our students. Mm -hmm. Well, uh... I don't want to dwell on these topics any further than necessary, but I always believe that, uh, you know, we build, every student must build a transcript and a resume. Uh, a transcript is given, it's pretty much every student gets it, 
but not every student intentionally builds a resume. And, and what you have shared is ways in which that a resume could be built through leadership experience, other kinds of experience and so on and so forth. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how we should continue to build the resume part of it besides the transcript part of it? I know some of you touched on it from a high impact practice and so on and so forth. Uh, anybody wants to share in that space? What, what do you think about uh, the building a resume piece? Jeff? Well, I think as a campus, we're certainly being more intentional thanks to Beth Mankey and, and her efforts in terms of high impact practices and how those can actually impact students' resumes. And then we're also working on uh, co-curricular pathways or blueprints um, that really support the academic units and what they're doing. But some campuses call them co-curricular transcripts. We may or may not get there, but it's really about, you know, yes, students are going to get a highly valued degree. But what are they going to do to add value on top of that and compete in this in this job market? And so we're really trying to tie even NACE competencies, which employers tell us, you know, each year, here are the 10 competencies that we're looking for. And how are we taking those competencies, looking at the experiences students are having outside of the classroom and really articulating that and helping the students define that and support that in their resume. And I think that's really that nice picture of, of taking it all the way through to graduation and helping them really share the experiences they're getting both in and outside the classroom so that they're mar more marketable upon graduation. Thank you, I would Jay. add, to, I would add yeah. to that, Dush, is that we know research tell, tell us that the high impact practices, they, they work, right? Um, two or more high impact practices. I think one of the, the failure of it is that no one, everybody doesn't know about it, right? Especially when we talk about closing the equity gap, those students that represent uh, historically underrepresented students, they don't tend to know about how, the building the resume or everything that's going on in career development services or um, internships, study abroad. So how do we bring that? It's our, it's our responsibility as leaders on campus, um, our own uh, putting onus on ourselves to bring that to our students, right? And so if that means we have to go to um, ethnic studies departments or all these different departments where we will find a lot of our underrepresented students at EOP, whatever it may be, guardian scholars, those are some of the places that we need to visit to market, to let and let people know, students know what is actually going on. And, and sometimes I think that we put a lot of the onus on the students to figure it out, right? And they're just trying to figure out college, especially a first generation student, is just trying to figure out where to get to their next class, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone how to build a resume. And so a lot of that is on us to make some of those things happen. That's a very good point, John. Beth, you have going to, you're going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to um, build off of what John and Jeff were saying is, I do think it's about meeting students where they're at and being intentional about it. And I think there are, are a couple of things that factor into that. One is I think we have to be willing um, to investigate our own practices and to recognize when we may have inadvertently uh, disadvantaged students. So we don't do it intentionally, but maybe the ways in which we construct certain high impact practices have inadvertently created um, groups of students who are already privileged become further privileged within those spaces. So I'm thinking specifically about internships. I think the traditional ways in which we have scripted those um, don't fit well for some of our students. And so we've had to really think outside the box about what works better for them. So I think that that actually is part of it. And I think to John's point too, that intentionality is that, you know, we put the onus on students to figure out the high impact practices when the the truth is, I think you would be hard pressed to find somebody across campus who would know where to send students for all of these high impact practices. So, you know, one of the things that we've been really advocating for is an audit of our high impact practices and then thinking about platforms where all those experiences can come together and we have a one stop shop for our students that, you know, they can look and say like, oh, wow, there's an internship, a study abroad, a research experience. Um, and that we're really thinking about that group of students I'm gonna call sort of the murky middle piece is that oftentimes who we target with some of our high impact practices are students who are already engaged in high impact practices. And so we end up with this sort of bimodal distribution. We have students who are doing multiple high impact practices. Um, and then we have this whole group of students who are doing none. 
Um, and so I think we have to think about what are the criteria, you know, sometimes if we're using GPA cutoffs or some other sort of cutoff is we are inadvertently saying to whole groups of students, um, you're not eligible for certain experiences. So again, I think that intentionality that both Jeff and John brought up is so crucial if we're thinking about meeting students where they're at, particularly in the space of high impact practices. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, Long Beach has proudly surpassed the 70% graduation rate for the uh, first time, not for all ethnicities, but you know, overall average wise above 70. There are very few institutions in the nation that can say the six year graduation rate is above 70%, particularly public institutions, right? On top of that, you know, we receive over 103,000 applications for, uh, for the campus and, uh, and we guarantee access to our local students, which is, I don't know, very many campuses can step up and say they guarantee access for local. And, uh, and so if the local students do not have access to Long Beach, they don't have access to higher education at all in many sense, right? So with all of these uh, pride points, the access and the success, it's, it's hard to believe that you actually can retain these high graduation rates. I'm really mm -hmm. amazed at what all of you do and all of us do in this space. It's a, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, celebration of success in many ways. And I'm very grateful all of you were able to take your time and join this conversation today. And, uh, and it's always a uh, proud moment when we have to work together on solving some of these big challenges for the campus.